Good morning, everybody. Well, as you can see, Ashton is gone. So we're going to do whatever we want. Bear with us. It'll make you appreciate him more when he comes back. All right. Well, with that, would everybody like to stand and join us in singing this morning? guys can be seated. Good morning. <coughs> Hope everyone is doing well today. I uh, wanted to start out by reading from Psalm 108. Psalm 108, it says, My heart is steadfast, O God. I will sing, I will sing praises even with my soul. Awake, harp, and lyre, I will awaken the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. 
For your loving kindness is great above the heavens, and your truth reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and your glory above all the earth, that your beloved may be delivered, save with your right hand, and answer me. Um, What a great and mighty God we serve. The God of eternity, the God who loves us with an incomprehensible love. Grateful for our worship team this morning. Uh, I remember when our church first started and Ashton was going to be out. He's out this weekend for a, a wedding. And uh, he and Emily are out. And uh, I know when we first church first started, when he was going to be out, we would scramble to find someone to lead the music. In fact, there was once where it was Saturday night, and we had not found anyone yet. And Ashton said, I might just have to lead the music. And I told Ashton, I was like, that would kill the church. No one would ever come back again. I can't do that. And so, uh, so but I'm grateful for a worship team now where they can just plug right in and just lead us in a God-honoring way. So thank you guys for that. A lot of pressure on you this morning now after saying all that. So... Uh, If you have your bulletin, open up here to the first page, if you will. I'm going to talk about this uh, insert in the bulletin later. Uh, But for now, I just wanted to mention a few things. First of all, before I forget this, on the way out your door there, there are some uh, bags of vegetables out there that someone brought and donated for anyone here who would like to take those with them. Uh, And this particular person, who will remain nameless, really wants them to be gone because when I came in, he was putting them out on seats just to joke with me as if, like, you come here, you've got to take a cucumber. It's just part of it. Can you imagine being a kid and getting here thinking there's a goodie for you on the seat and you go and you find a cucumber? That would be, that would be awful. That would just be terrible. So I like cucumbers, but as a kid, I'd, you know, I'd rather have like candy or something for sure. So, um, several things. First of all, if you're interested in being part of a men's group, there's going to be just kind of a brief little meeting just to gauge interest to see if anyone would like to do this immediately after in the kitchen area. So we encourage you to go there after this service and, uh, and, and find out a little bit more there. Uh, upcoming weeknight schedule. I wanted to read through this because I just want us to all be on the same, here, same page here. Community groups are going to start back the week of September 28th. Uh, next week, there will be specific times, locations, and all that in the bulletin. Uh, children and youth meet every Wednesday. Uh, they can be dropped off as early as 545 and need to be picked up at 715. That's for children's ministry as babies through fourth. Uh, and they're going to be here in the main building. They will start, children's ministry for Wednesday nights will start back the week of the 28th. So it's not starting back this week. It'll be the week of the 28th. Middle school, on the other hand, is already back in meeting now. That's grades 5th through 8th. Uh, and they meet across the street at uh, 615 Fifth Avenue. Uh, and they're going to, even though they've had a different time to this point that they've been meeting, they're going to go ahead and switch over and adopt the new time that will start for our kids and our adult groups Uh, on Wednesday night. So starting this week, middle school will be dropped off at 545 and picked up by 715. Uh, And then our high school group, 9th through 12th, they're going to meet each Wednesday night at 630 and they start back this Wednesday. Is that confusing enough to everyone? All right, good. If it's confusing, which it probably is, basically we'll kind of all be on the same page starting the week of the 28th. So just wanted to to mention all of that to you uh, this morning. I'm going to open us in prayer. I'm super excited about this morning and, uh, you know, last week and this week are Vision Sundays where we're talking about the three purposes of our church, the three most important things. And today is also a day of commitment where we're going to ask you to uh, fill out a card if you're willing to do so and, uh, and just commit to a few things in life our church. I told my wife, I said, you can tell that I'm not administratively gifted at all considering that I planned Vision Sunday over holiday weekend. But God's in charge and he knew that I was going to make this blunder, but it's going it's to be good. So I'm going to ask you guys right now to bow your heads and close your eyes. God, thank you so much for your love and your grace in our lives. Lord, we thank you that as we read that psalm earlier, you are the God of great loving kindness. Your loving kindness reaches to the heavens, Lord. Your grace, your mercy are extravagant in our lives. And Lord, this morning, uh, grateful for everyone who is here in person or watching online. Thank you, thankful for uh, the way that you each week uh, so faithfully allow us to, to, to be a part of what you're doing here in Belfouche. And so God, we thank you for who you are and what you're doing. Lord, this morning as we open up your word, as we talk about the priorities of community and missions, I pray that you would burden our hearts and help us to understand our place in this journey and this mission you have called us on in life. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you guys mind standing with us if you sing a couple more songs this morning?
Well, there is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. And all is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear. No more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand, and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day, glorious day that will be. It's a place 
my fading soul. Be a lamp for all my days, and I will walk in endless joy. Oh, to taste and see the gospel as I never have before. Be a lamp for all my days, and I shall walk in endless joy. Amen. You guys can be seated. So I, uh, last time Travis led, I uh, jokingly told him that he sounded like Johnny Cash. And... Um, and it was kind of funny because the song that he led last time, when I told him that, he said that he had, apparently Johnny Cash had a gospel album that had that particular song on it. He said that would have been listening to all week to prepare for it. So it made sense. <laughs> that next Sunday night, we were in Hedinger with our group there, and they were talking about the pre, you know, week before service. And they said, who's the bearded guy that led last week the song? I said, that's Travis. And they said, he sounded like Johnny Cash. So, <laughs> hey, it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. All right, before I uh, jump into the content of this message, I have a couple of housekeeping items to mention. Uh, first, I'm not going to be here the next two Sundays. I'll be out the next couple. Uh, next weekend, we're going to a planned uh, family gathering to, to just spend some time with our families. Then the following week, we will be out for a conference. I was supposed to be at this conference back in April, and then coronavirus hit, and everything happened, and they canceled it and had to rebook the flights and the uh, conference for September 20th. So uh, other than mission trips... I don't think I've ever missed two Sundays in a row. That was not the plan back in April, but like a lot of things this year, those plans were changed. So I think you can all relate to that. Uh, so Damon Woolsey will be preaching next week. I'm excited for you to hear from him. And then the following week, uh, Jan Ballard, who is the pastor of Connection Church in Spearfish, will be here to share. So excited for you guys to hear from both of them. I know you're going to be blessed by what they have to share from God's Word. Second thing I wanted to say is if you're a guest with us or if you were unable to worship with us last week, today is part two of sermons I'm preaching related to the vision of our church. I usually share sermons like these this time each year as we're starting a new school year. Uh, but so, so last week and this week are going to be a little bit different from a sermon perspective uh, as they are meant to motivate our church to action in key areas, what we believe to be the most important purposes of our church. So last week I talked about the three purposes, and those are worship, community, and missions. Worship, connecting with God, community, connecting with people, and missions, connecting people with God. Uh, last week we, we, we talked about the purpose of worship, and I broke that down into three parts, worshiping God as individuals, worshiping God as families, and worshiping God as a church family. Um, and and uh, related to that purpose of our church of worship, there are three things that we are asking you to consider committing to this coming year. The first one is to read through the New Testament in a year. Uh, and by the way, our website, our new website is up and running. Highly encourage you to check it out. It is uh, very clean, very user friendly. And uh, on our website, if you will go to our homepage, bellfushconnection.com, scroll to the very bottom, you will see a couple of resources there. First of all, there is a New Testament reading plan that you can click on, and then you can download that. You can print it off, or you can just follow along daily through our website. Uh, so that was the first commitment we asked you to make. Read through the New Testament by this time next year. The second thing was this, facilitate or participate in a weekly family devotional time. Um, and in order to, and again, I, as I mentioned last week, I know that can be very intimidating uh, for us to do, but um, to help with that, we also, same thing, go to our homepage, scroll to the bottom, and there's a family worship guide that will be updated each week that you can, uh, that you can use to help facilitate just a five or so minute little family devotional each week. And then the third thing we ask you to do, and this is, again, not really a measurable goal, I know that, but it's just make Sunday worship a priority. I, again, not legalistically, we sometimes have to work or we're on vacation or we're, we're ill or whatever it may be. This is not a legalistic thing, but just as often as you're able, make Sunday morning a priority because it is a good thing to assemble together as brothers and sisters in the faith uh, each week. So that was the, the priority of worship. And today I want to talk about the other two priorities, and that is community, <clears throat> community and missions. So we'll start out with community, uh, and, and there's a little outline on the back here, 
If you'd like to follow along, there's also a commitment card that I'm going to highlight here in a few minutes. We're going to go over together in a few minutes. Uh, but by community, I'm talking about small groups. Now, I, I've changed the names of our small groups to community groups, and this is confession time. But this is, we, the church has been in existence a little over six years now, six and a half years. And uh, this is the fourth and final name change of our small groups, okay? Child, it's like I change it every year. Everyone's like, so what are these called now? We never know what they're called. I've called them small groups, connect groups, grow groups. But I like the name community group best, and, and we're going to stick with that name from this point forward. I think that community groups best communicate what these groups are and what we want them to be about. So first of all, they, they meet primarily in homes. So they are literally in the community. They're meeting in the community. We desire that they function as a way for people to find Christian community, find friendship, and we want them to be active in serving our community. So for those reasons, I believe that name is the best reflective of what we desire these groups to be, community groups. Now, over the years, we have pushed these groups fairly hard. We absolutely as a church understand the importance of being connected beyond just Sunday morning. Uh, I, I know that friendships can and do grow during this hour on Sunday mornings. I've seen it happen. I looked around before the service and saw people talking and just, you know, going deeper in their friendship through, through conversation on Sunday morning. But we also know that relationships grow best in an atmosphere like community groups. But here's what has happened in the past. And again, this is just confession time. Here's what's happened in the past. I've made pulpit announcements about community groups, about how we're going to invest in these groups. But over time, from a leadership level, they've kind of fizzled out. So I, and, and, I, and I fully understand this. I've just not done a good, a good job of leading our church in this area. In fact, I went back and looked at my old notes, uh, records from the past few years of small groups. And, and sadly, since 2016, these really have not grown much at all. They've pretty well stayed the same, same people for the most part, the same groups, uh, and so, so this is a priority. It's going to be a priority moving forward from, from my perspective and hopefully from a, just a congregational level that will buy into this and understand the importance of it. Now, here was my realization. This is what is driving a lot of this, this renewed passion for this. Back in March, March and April, when we had seven weeks where we didn't meet on Sunday morning, the first couple of weeks as a pastor, I, was, I didn't really know what to do. It was, it was the first time in 18 years I've been in ministry where I didn't see people just wasn't around anyone, and I felt kind of helpless. I felt kind of like, you know, how do I keep everyone connected? How do we stay together and when we're not meeting together, when we don't, we're literally not seeing or physically being, you know, in the same room together? And it just kind of clicked with me about week two of all the COVID stuff that if we had had community groups meeting around our town, vibrant groups, then we wouldn't have missed a beat through all of that, those seven weeks. We could have simply streamed in the services and encouraged our groups to continue meeting in small groups and groups of, you know, 10, 12 or less, <laughs> social distancing, right, in small groups and worshiping together on Sunday mornings. We wouldn't have missed a, a beat. So part of my urgency in this area of our church is driven by that, just being mobilized in case, Lord forbid, something like that were to happen again. Now, practically, let me share something else. Um, and again, this is a holiday weekend, which is a better turnout in the first service than I thought we'd have on a holiday weekend. So bravo to all of you for being here this morning. Uh, but I don't know if you've noticed this, but we've had a ton of visitors lately. Have any of you just happened to notice a lot of new faces? Let, let me tell you this. Last week, last Sunday was kind of our first normal Sunday back, I would say. School started this week, and so it was kind of like last week was a bit of normalcy again. And, and if I counted right, we had five, possibly six families that visited last week that are brand new to the area, that just moved here. So we've had a ton of, and throughout the, throughout the whole summer, that was remarkable to me. We had new people almost every week showing up to church. And, uh, and, and I really believe that once, you know, everything is more stabilized and all the COVID stuff is behind us, we're, we're post-summer now, I really believe we have the potential to be packed here on Sunday mornings. I mean, really, really packed. Now, we have some long-term goals of doing renovations here to accommodate that growth. In fact, it looks like late October, we're going to be able to move forward with renovating our office area over there into, into off, in better office space and into a big kids area to, to be able to have kids worship over there. Uh, hopefully, and you can pray for this, this time next year, we're going to be able to finish out this sanctuary and do a, add about another 75 or 80 seats into here, plus a really big nursery area. So I'm really excited about all those things. Pray for wisdom in that. Pray for favor in that. But there is a chance. The reason I bring all that up, there is a chance that when things subside with the virus stuff, and, and again, we get back into more of a regular routine and everything, if we get all of our pre-COVID people back plus new people, there is a chance that we might end up having to add another Sunday morning service until we're able to do these renovations. 
Now, I know some of you are probably are like, man, I don't, just don't, I don't even really like being in two services. I certainly don't want to be in three. Two things from my perspective. Number one, it's kind of, a, it's a good thing, right? I mean, it's growth. That's what we desire. We want the church to grow. We want more people to be hearing the word of God, to be going out on mission and so forth. So it's exciting. On the other hand, some of you think it sounds exhausting. Listen, me more than anyone, it sounds exhausting doing three services. So until we're able to accommodate and, and renovate, there is a chance. I'm not saying we are, but there's a chance we might have to add another Sunday morning service. And as a result of that, community groups become even more important as our church body is split up possibly even more on Sunday mornings. Let me share a few more practical reasons why community groups are so important. Uh, first of all, accountability. Accountability. A community group that has been cultivated properly is a safe place. There's confidentiality, a place to share burdens, a place to share struggles and victories, a place to share life with others. I talk about this a lot, but Satan desires that we be isolated people because when you're isolated, you are easy pickings for him. Uh, I mean, I think about the, the African scene you see in the, in the safaris out on the plains of the Maasai Mara in Kenya, in Tanzania. You see the, the, the Nat Geo, the National Geographic shows, and you see the wildebeest herd, and you see that one little sick one that's off to the side. It can't keep up with the herd. Guess what the lions are going to go after? They're not going to jump into the middle of the, of the herd there. They're going to go after the one weak one that is away from its herd that is isolated. And it is true with the Christian as well. So for accountability, for encouragement, they are important. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up. We live in an extremely discouraging time. You, you flip on, you know, get online or watch the news or see the, the state of our, not only our nation, but our world right now, and it is easy to be bombarded with discouragement. And we need others to encourage us. These, these community groups are places where people can share their burdens with others and be encouraged. There are people who carry burdens into our services here on Sunday mornings. And if they don't really know anyone, if they don't really have Christian community, then they carry those burdens out the door with them and never really have a connection point to share them with others and have encouragement. Now, someone might say, well, that's their responsibility to get plugged in. And that is true. There is an element of that involved, but it's also our responsibility, for example, on Sunday mornings to come in and look around and say, I don't know that person over there. I'm going to go talk to them. I'm going to welcome them. I'm going to invite them to get involved. It is our responsibility as well. So not only encouragement, but there's also in community groups an opportunity for spiritual knowledge. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. I, I love the diversity of our community groups that we've had in the past. You might have a person in a group who has been a, a follower of Jesus for three or four or five decades, and they might be sitting right next to someone who is a brand new believer. What a great opportunity to be discipled as a younger believer. What a great opportunity to disciple another as someone who is a little farther along in the faith. Another benefit of these groups is it is a place to invite someone who is on the fringes. You might have friends around you in your neighborhood who would dare not darken the door of a church building. Uh, we had a guy that came here several years. This has probably been five years ago now. And he was from a really, really rough background. And uh, it's back, it's, it was pre-2016 because our building was, I, I can visually remember the way it was set up in here when he walked in the door. And I watched, I, I watched as he struggled to take a step over the threshold into this building because he had it in his mind that if he did, he was going to burst into flames. I mean, he thought God's going to judge me if I walk into this church. And, you know, and that sounds extreme, but there are people out there, maybe, maybe not a lot that extreme, but there are a lot of people out there who will not darken the door of a church building. But maybe, just maybe, if they had an invitation from someone in their neighborhood to come to their house for a, a little time of Bible study and fellowship with other people, they might do that. And that might be the catalyst through which they come into the kingdom of God where they, where they meet Christ. What, a, what an awesome and beautiful thing that would be. These community groups are a great place for ministry. A community group that is working together can do so much for the kingdom of God. They can adopt people. Maybe it's a foster family they know that is just in need of encouragement. They're in need of, of, of meals being brought to them or whatever it might be. Or maybe there's widows or widowers they know or single moms. They can adopt people and do ministry. They can adopt ministries or ministry projects in our area and they can really make a difference for Jesus. Here's another practical reason these groups are, are so vital. As our church grows, so do the needs of our members and attenders. Unfortunately, people 
fall through the cracks sometimes if they don't go beyond Sunday morning. And again, that requires intentionality from those of us who are here to, to identify them, to invite them. Often all people need is an invitation, a simple invitation. Another thing that often happens is there might be a need with someone in the body of faith. And it's a legitimate, valid need, but nobody knows about that. Nobody knows about that, and so the church doesn't help. And we want to help. We want to be, but we've got to know those needs. And that best happens through relationships within the body. You know, as our church grows, it bothers me that I don't know everyone's names. It really, I work hard at that. I'll go through our, our, our list at times and just like try and put names with faces. I want to know names. I want to know what's happening in people's lives. When we were 50, 60, 70 people, I pretty well knew everybody, and I knew mostly what was going on in their lives. I knew, for the most part, what they were struggling with, victories in life, things like that. But I find myself now not really knowing everyone, not knowing what's going on, and that's okay. That is, that is absolutely okay, but this is where community groups help in that area so much to bridge that gap to help people assimilate into the life of church. And there are a lot of other reasons why these groups are important. Those are just a few things that are causing me to have a renewed passion and urgency to have these vibrant groups within our church. Now, another question that we've had people ask, why do you do these in homes? Now, honestly, I really wanted to give you a hyper-spiritual answer here and say something like, well, the early church met in homes, you know, and so we want to model after them. But let's just be honest there. They met in homes because they were being persecuted. They met in homes because, for example, the churches that met in Ephesus, they didn't have cars to hop in and drive to the other side of town. They met where they were. But now, and actually, there is a logistical reason, though, that we do our small groups and our community groups. It's going to take me a while to get that language down. Community groups in homes. And part of it is we simply don't have the facilities to do them here. We don't have classrooms all throughout this building. Now, I've, I've been in Sunday school settings in the past and loved them. I mean, how many of you grew up in Sunday school? That was, that was your model, all right? I'm the same way. I grew up in Sunday school. I love Sunday school. I've been in churches in the past where we did home-based community groups like what we are doing here. I like them both a lot. I see the validity in both of them. I think I, I like the, the home-based groups a little bit better because they tend to be a little bit more welcoming to people. There's just something more hospitable and warm about being invited to a person's home. I know that for some, going to, to a person's home can be intimidating if maybe you're more introverted or uh, just don't want to impose on anyone, but there is a more relaxed atmosphere typically. But at the end of the day, whether it is a Sunday school facility-based or a home-based uh, community group, the, the, the goal should ultimately be the same. Um, you know, and so I, I do want to, I know I'm jumping all over the place with this. I've just got a lot of thoughts up here that are rattling around. So this is more of just me talking and sharing kind of my heart for all this. But uh, we are going to have at least initially one group that does meet here on Wednesday nights, meets here in the sanctuary. And uh, part of the reason we're going to do that, really the main driving reason we're going to do that is because we do know there are people in our church who may not be comfortable right now just yet with the COVID stuff going and sitting in a little small group right next to other people in someone's living room. We understand that. And so we're going to have one here at the sanctuary that's going to be a little bit more spread out and so forth. Uh, I don't know that we'll do that, that one long term, but we felt for now that might be a good option to have for some. So all of that said, community groups are going to start back the week of September 28th, and we're going to have a list next week of all of the information on those. The reason I say the week of the 28th is we're not just going to have Wednesday nights. Most of them are going to be Wednesday nights, but we are going to have a, uh, a couple others that are uh, alternate nights that you can, can be a part of if you, if you need to do that. Uh, so commitment number four, you know, we had three last week. Commitment number four from this community purpose is this. I will join a community group and attend as often as I am able. So all we're asking here is this, just give it a try. Give it a try, plug into one, and just be there as often as you can. So to recap, read through the New Testament in one year, facilitate or participate in family worship once a week. The, night, the reading plan, the family guide are on our website, bottom of the homepage. Be here on Sunday morning as often as you're able. And then number four, join a community group and participate as often as you are able. So worship, community, and then the final purpose is this, missions. Missions. Missions are one of the keys to the health of a Christian and to a church. Now, I've heard the argument before that says, why should we go to the other side of the world when there's so much to be done here? Why should we go to Africa? Why should we go to Russia? Why should we go to South America? Why go when there's so much to be done here? And that is a, that is a great question. It really is. I understand the, the reasoning behind that question. 
And, and first of all, I want you to know that when I say missions is a priority of our, uh, should be a priority of us as individuals, as in a church, and as a church, I'm, I'm talking about missions as a lifestyle. Lifestyle missions. I'm talking about missions here and abroad. It's not, a lot of times we think it's an either or thing when really it's both and. God has called us to be faithful where we are, to take the message of Christ to others, and He's called us when He opens up doors to go to other places. And, and listen, we have a responsibility in that. We live right now in a day and age where we can literally get to the other side of the world in 18 hours. We can go to the other side of this globe and share the gospel with others, and we have a responsibility because of that. Missions are vital. Missions are vital. But, but to just really quickly address that question, why go to the other side of the world when we have so much to do here? There's a very simple answer to that question, and it's the answer of access. Access. There is not as much access to the gospel in most parts of the world as we have right here in this little town. I mean, you think about our town right now, and this just off the top of my head, there's at least seven or eight or nine gospel preaching churches in this town. If someone wakes up tomorrow morning and there's a hollowness in their heart and they know that, that God is missing from their life, they could pick up the phone and call multiple churches in our town, in our area, and they could have someone clearly articulate the gospel to them. That's not the case in a lot of places in this world. There's a lot of places in this world where, first of all, the Bible has not been translated into their language, where if they were to go out and try and find more about God, find out more about God, they wouldn't be able to find a church within hundreds of miles. They wouldn't be able to find a believer anywhere near them. And so the issue is this, why go there when there's so much to be done here? The, the answer is access. The answer is we do both. We're here and abroad. That is God's call. We've got to be missions-minded people. Missions are important to our church, to all churches, because when a church turns inward and they begin to focus only within the four walls of their building, only on themselves, that church is on a path to a slow, drawn-out death. Now, that may sound harsh, but it is very true. I've seen it happen many times. I'm going to give you an example of this. I've used this example before, but I think it's a powerful example. Near the southeast Missouri town of Jackson, sits the remains of a church building that was a church by the name of Old Bethel Church. It is the oldest Protestant church west of the Mississippi River. It formed officially in 1806. Prior to 1804, they could not legally exist as a church. At that time, the territory they were in was owned by the, by the French and the Spanish, and it was illegal for Protestant churches to assemble, to be recognized officially. So Protestants... In that area, they would meet in homes. They would meet in barns, wherever they could to avoid persecution and even prosecution. There was a great cost to being a Protestant in that area at that time. And so there were actually some preachers who would risk their very lives by swimming across the Mississippi River from Illinois in the middle of the night, freezing cold under the cover of darkness to go in and to preach the gospel, to preach the Bible to these brothers and sisters who were meeting undercover. But in 1804, everything changed. The Louisiana Purchase occurred. And that territory was bought by the United States, and it was immediately no longer illegal for Protestant churches to assemble. So in 1806, Old Bethel Church was built, the oldest Protestant church west of the Mississippi. And as you can imagine, that church with their newfound freedom, they grew and they grew and they grew. They were a vibrant body of faith. In fact, in the first eight years that they were officially recognized as a church, they planted in eight years nine other churches in their area, sent people out to plant these churches, and their congregation grew ten times their original size. People in the community were coming to Christ, and the church was thriving, and it was reaching people. The original boards from that first building built in 1806 are still there, and they have been reconstructed to what was to what the first building would have looked like. Now, that church started in 1806, and it was alive for 61 years, and then it died. Closed its doors. And, and, and here's why it died. It was not because of persecution. Persecution could not kill it. In fact, that church flourished in the midst of persecution because they were driven together. They were driven. They were united by the gospel. Persecution couldn't kill it. It was not because of hardship. 
like having pastors swim across the Mississippi River to preach and meeting in barns and meeting under the cover of darkness. It was not because of that. It was not the harsh living conditions, the long hours of farming and the difficulty of life they had. It was not even because of conflict among the members. None of that could kill it. Here's why it died. And this is powerful because these are not my words. This is an inscription that was written as to why it died. This plaque with these words, is is on the old constructed building right now. Here's what it said. Old Bethel flourished as long as she was reaching out, but fell into decline as the membership took an anti-missions stand. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? It took it. When it began to focus on itself and turn inward is when it started on that path to death. The last minutes of the church were recorded in 1867, and then it closed its doors for the last time. They thrived, they flourished, they grew, but when they became anti-missions and focused on themselves, everything changed. When their outward focus ceased to exist, so did the church. There was another church that closed years back in the Northeast, and their last, and it was a vibrant church, same thing. And their last Sunday there, They put a sign on the door that said, going out of business because we forgot what our business was. Powerful statements. Now, in this way, in this sense, not a lot has changed over the last 200 years when it relates to church and inward and outward focus. Churches with a heart for ministry tend to be more vibrant. Listen to what Tom Rainer, this is coming up to modern day, listen to what Tom Rainer recently wrote about this. Rainer was a pastor for many, many years. He's now a, uh, he studies churches and studies church trends and consults churches to help them. And after 25 years of studying churches in America, as you can imagine, he has some great insight to, to give to churches. And here's an article he wrote recently. He says, I see a simple but profound pattern among declining churches. Simply stated, he wrote, the most common factor in declining churches is an inward focus. The ministries are only for the members, he wrote. The budgetary funds are used almost exclusively to meet the needs of the members. The times of worship and worship styles are geared primarily for the members. Conflict takes place when members don't get things their way. He said, you get the picture. And then he went on to write this. After studying and consulting with thousands of churches, I began to clearly see this pattern. Even more, I began to recognize symptoms of an inward focus. And he said, see if you recognize a few of these. First of all, he said, there are very few attempts to minister to those in the community. It's, they're, just, they're just hanging on. An inward focus, keeping what they have, not desiring to give away. Secondly, he said, church business meetings become arguments over preferences and desires. Number three, any change necessary to become a great commission church is met with anger and resistance. And then number four, and I'll be honest with you, when I read this, this was convicting to me because I think we all fall into this trap, especially in the year 2020, especially with an election year, with COVID and everything that's happened. Here's what he said. This is challenging and it's convicting. He said, another warning symptom of an inward focus of churches is this. Culture is seen as the enemy instead of an opportunity for believers to become salt and light. How true is that? It's easy to get into our cocoons and say, boy, our nation is going crazy right now. And that's true, it is, right? It is. But it's easy to see, every, to see all of those people as our enemies rather than understanding they're our mission field. We're not to, to run away from those things. We are to go after those things in the name of Jesus. We are to be salt and we are to be light. Now here's the other side, the other obvious side to this article that Tom Rainer wrote. Outwardly focused churches are the ones that usually are thriving. And that's because God blesses a church that has a selfless heartbeat. God has called us as individuals and as a church to put the needs of others before our own. That is the very call of the gospel. It's the very heart of our Lord. Listen to Philippians 2, 3 through 5. Paul wrote this, Do nothing with selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Now that statement alone right there, is so difficult, isn't it, to put the needs of others before ourselves. And then Paul wrote, do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. We are to be on mission as individuals and collectively as a church. The final words that Jesus shared prior to his ascension were that we were to go, therefore, and make disciples of all people groups. Literally, in the Greek, it's, it's the word ethne, 
where we get our word ethnic from. He was saying we're to go to every, every people group of the world and make disciples. Literally, it's as you're going. As you're going through life, wherever you are, you take the gospel with you. We are to go there for And then Jesus, last thing he said was this, before he ascended, lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. He promised his presence to be with us. Now, one of the things that we've focused on really hard since our church started has been getting people to go on mission trips. I've, I know the value of mission trips. They are valuable for the people that we minister to. They're valuable for the individual going. There is something that is enlivened in our hearts when we go and we see when we go and we experience, when we go and we look people in the eyes and we understand the needs of this world. Those of you who have been on mission trips, you know that. You have seen that. You've experienced that. It's valuable for those we minister. It's valuable to us, and it is valuable to the sending church. As people come back and they share what God has done in them and through them, there is an infectious nature in that. There's something about that that is just an awesome and a unifying thing. Now, to this point, we've only had a handful of people go on mission trips. And um, 2020 looked like our year. I, I don't know if you knew this or not, but we had 32 people. The most we'd ever had going on an international trip was six or seven. We had 32 people committed. And by committed, I mean they had turned in money. We had plane tickets reserved. 32 committed to go to Costa Rica this year. We had 12, and it was counting, to go to Missouri on a mission trip. And, and it, 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 it just looked like this was our year. Now, now, this church has been awesome to give away to missions. I, I, what I'm about to tell you now is not a bragging thing at all. It's just, a, it's, it's just the truth. Last year, I went back and looked over our church's finances from last year. Last year, just last year, this doesn't include all the other years, last year, we were able to give away right at $93,000 to missions, to church planting, to local outreaches and local ministries. $93,000. And that is through our budget, that is through special offerings, and that is a testimony to your faithfulness to give from the beginning. This has been a giving body. You guys have been awesome to donate, to give, and thank you for that. We will never know this side of eternity the lives that that is touching. I'm convinced there will be people in heaven in God's understanding of everything who will have come to Christ as a result of dollars that were given that sent missionaries out to the ends of the earth. Thank you for your faithfulness to give. But 2020 was... Finally going to be the breakthrough year where we were able to get a lot of people to actually go on mission trips. And then guess what happened? COVID happened. Like everything else, that is the answer to 2020. And, and it was very disappointing to me, but, but listen, God is in charge. And so here's my philosophy now. 2021 is going to be our year. It's going to be our I have no doubt that we're going to have great participation in 2021. No doubt about it at all. So here are the, the three, the, the three commitments. I'm educated in Mississippi. The three commitments we're asking from you. The three commitments we're asking for you, and this is right, commitment number five. Here's where you go, number five. Commitment number five is this. I will be part of a mission trip in 2021 either by going, giving, and or praying. Again, check our website. We've got four trips that we are tentatively planning right now. Uh, the one to Costa Rica and one to Bismarck, those are two that we're almost certain we're going to do. And then there's two others that we are looking at possibly doing. We just want to gauge interest. Look at that. Let me know if you're interested in any of those. Give me a little feedback on that. That would be great. So that is on our website. So commitment number five, you can see here on this card, be a part of a mission trip by either going, giving, or praying. Commitment number six, I will serve in at least one local outreach of the church in the next year. And I think most of you have probably already done that. We've had a lot of outreaches. 20, again, 2020, not nearly as many as we normally have uh, because of everything. But 2021, we'll get back to our normal routine of a lot of outreaches. And we'd love for you to be a part of one of those. And then commitment number seven, maybe you're interested in serving on a ministry team. You can see all those different teams at the bottom there. And if you're interested in serving on one of those, check that and then circle one of those. And we will, within the next few weeks for sure, get you the information, connect you with the team leader so that you can get involved in one of those teams. Worship, community, and missions. Those are the purposes of our church. Love God, love people, reach out to the world. Now, let me just say this. The, the, the goal in all of these commitments is not just to check a box as individuals. We are, as Americans, we like checking boxes to feel better about ourselves sometimes, I think. That's not the goal of these. Just checking these boxes and just, just doing good works, that's not the goal of these. Serving or going on a mission trip, reading the Bible, those things are not just a, uh, they're not the end, right? They're, 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 not, they're not the goal. They are a means 
by which we can love God more and serve people in the name of Jesus. They are also a means of accountability for us. I plan to fill out one of these cards as it holds me accountable as well. And so for, for a couple of uh, minutes before we kind of go into a time of commitment, I do f- feel very you know, uh, necessary to share something else that is vitally important to every one of us in this room. Um, I don't ever want to close a service out like this without, without just talking a little bit about the gospel and what Christ has done for us. Uh, and so, so maybe, maybe today you would say you don't know Christ. I'm absolutely convinced there are people in our churches who don't have a relationship with Him. They're at church every week, but they don't know Christ. And maybe, maybe as I've talked about last week and this week about loving God, loving people, living life on mission, maybe there's something missing in your heart, and you know there is. The Bible tells us, John 3, 16, that God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That is the good news of the gospel. Christ came and did what we couldn't do. Here's the bad news, Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned, everybody. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And, and God is holy. He is enthroned above in perfect holiness, and God cannot allow sin into his presence. He can't allow, when you die and you stand before God, you can't say to him, well, I did a lot of good things. My good outweighed my bad. No, God is infinitely holy. And even one sin separates us from God. And the Bible tells us here, for all have sinned, Romans 3.23, every one of us, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 6.23 says the wages, that which we have earned because of our sin is death, eternal separation from God. But here's the other side of this, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so I just want to ask you all this morning, have you surrendered your life to Christ? Have you understood that Jesus is the Son of God who died for you on the the cross, paying the penalty for your sin? Have you asked Him to forgive you and to be the Lord of your life? If not, there is no greater day to do that than today. Give your life to Christ today. I would love to talk with you about that if you have never done that. And I would even say for those in this room who have been a part of a church for a very, very long time, it's good every now and then for us just to assess our relationship with Christ and say, first of all, am I truly in the faith? And second, am I walking with God? So I, I hope and I pray that you will really think about those things today. I, I just want to share with you guys, I am super excited about what God is doing in our church. This has been an overly frustrating year for everybody. Uh, as, a, as a pastor, not knowing what people, you know, there's, so many, there's just so many different moving parts in church life right now. It's been very, very frustrating, but I will tell you, I am super excited about what God is doing. I see so many good things happening in the midst of all of this, uh, this, you know, what Satan intended for evil, God intended for good and is using for good, and we know that. So to recap, here are the commitments we are asking you to make. If you'll just follow along in this uh, card right here, commitment number one, I will read through the New Testament in a year. It's on our website. God will use this to grow you if you, will, if you will do this. Commitment number two, facilitate or participate in a family devotional time at least once a week. The guide is on our website. This will stretch your faith to lead this, to participate in it, but God will use it in your life. And then number three, I'll be here as often as I can on Sunday morning. Commitment number four, I'll join a community group and be there as often as I can. Just give it a try is what we're asking. Just commit to just giving it a try. Number five, be a part of a mission trip either by going, giving, and or praying. Again, those trips are on our website. If you're interested in one of those, come and see me. Give me some feedback on that. I'd love to, to hear from you. Commitment number six, I'll serve in at least one local outreach in the church in the next year. Commitment number seven, I'm interested in serving on a ministry team. Now, if you're a guest with us today or if you're watching this online and you're new to the church, we're not necessarily asking you to participate in this time of commitment unless you just really want to, unless it's something that God puts on your heart and you think maybe this is a church you could plug into and, and really be a part of. But if you're a member or a regular, we encourage you to participate in this. Now, let me just, I mean, if you want to check every box here, great. I mean, that'd be awesome if you did. But there might be a few of these things you just in honesty would say, I'm not going to commit to that right now. But I do sense God leading me to commit to these other things. Whatever you sense God leading you to, please just check that box and let us know. We want to help you in this. We want to pray with you in these things. We want to, uh, to be on, on, on the same team with you in this. Uh, so for the next few minutes, I, I want you to prayerfully look over these cards. Jeremy, would you come and just uh, and the worship team, come on up. Um, next few minutes, I want you to prayerfully look over these cards that are in front of you. If you're ready to fill it out today, that is great. If you want to hold on to it for a few days and really pray and say, God, what would you have me be a part of here? Uh, then that is great too. But all we're asking you to do is fill this out 
And uh, I thought about having like a commitment time where you brought it up front and everything, but I know that that is very uncomfortable for some people, so we're not going to do that. But on your way out in the back here is our offering box. If you're willing to commit to some of these or all of these, just fold that up, drop it in, the, put your name on it, fold it up and put it back there, and that would be awesome. We would greatly appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to ask Jeremy and uh, the band to just kind of play softly for a couple of minutes while you look over the card. And, uh, and after a couple of minutes, uh, he is going to, uh, they're going to lead us in a time of worship. Next couple of minutes, just look at these cards. If you're willing to commit to any of these, please do so now. And as I said, if you want to hold off and just kind of pray through this, please do that as well. love awkward silence. I'm going to pray for us now. Father, we commit this time to you, Lord. I thank you for everyone who is here, those who are uh, watching online right now. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be committed to the mission you have called us to. God, help us to go deeper in our relationship with you. Help us to commit to, to read your word regularly, to, to take it in regularly. God, help us to, to go deeper in our prayer lives. God, help us to go deeper in our evangelism, recognizing the needs of those around us. God, help us to, to understand the importance of community and being plugged in. And Lord, help us to understand the urgency of taking your message here and abroad. God, thank you for this time, Lord. We commit it to you. Lord, as we sing this final song, I pray that you would be honored in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to before I walk off the stage, I want to tell you guys this. I am so grateful for each and every one of you. I love you guys. I love this church. I'm excited about what God is doing in this body. I would ask you to pray for me and my family as we head out late, uh, late, later this week. Uh, we'll be gone for a few days uh, on vacation. And as I said, to a conference, just pray for safety there. And I encourage you to make every effort you can uh, to be here next Sunday and the following as Damon and uh, Pastor Jan are going to be sharing. Love you guys. Hope you have a great week. I'm going to ask you to stand and we're going to sing our way out.
give the same. 